I'm quite in love with this landscape as I am with the North Dakota landscape. It feels very tangible to stand where your forefathers have stood. In some ways, that's also fueled my interest in North Dakota. What was it like to homestead there? What do these people have to do? Where do they come from? As they stood out in that wonderful openness of North Dakota, they were comparing that to, their, to the landscape that shaped them. And in my case, it was Iceland. So to have that experience to stand in both places and think about what that experience must have been like was pretty profound. Funding for this program is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund, the North Dakota Council on the Arts, and by the members of Prairie Public. I was fascinated by a poet who lived in Mountain, North Dakota, an Icelandic community where my father grew up. His name was Cowan Julius, and he, went to, he wrote under the initials K-N, or Cowan, as the old Icelanders called him. And it became apparent that I should go to where Cowan came from, Iceland. So I came here to photograph where Cowan Julius had come from, and I ended up becoming very aware of my Icelandic heritage. Because in hunting for Cowan's place, I learned about church records, and I learned about the sagas, and so I started tracking down my ancestral landscapes. Given the way I photograph and use large format uh, photography, I needed a place to change my film. I had seen an exhibit at the Walker in the early 80s that was called Frozen Image, and it divided the work of these photographers in Scandinavia by country. And I went back to the section on Iceland, found the living photographer whose work I liked the most, and it was some guy named Gudmundur Inglipsen, and uh, I called up information in Reykjavik. Is Hella close to uh, Selfos? Yeah, it's north of me. Wayne saw that my first name was Gudmundur, and his family name is Gudmundsson, so he, maybe he hoped we were related, and in fact we are. Seven generations back, we have a common forefather. He had my name looked up in the Icelandic like telephone book and simply called and asked if he could use my darkroom. That was the first proposal. And when I came, he was just, uh, he and his wife, uh, Hedla, were just the, the most gracious of hosts and hostesses and showed me all kinds of things. And over the course of that week, we became friends. I was watching him like the, uh, the proud father showing off his kid to someone who hasn't seen it before. I mean, he clearly has a love affair of the Icelandic landscape. And I think his photographs have more of the presence of the landscape and the respect for it and the love of the outdoors. We went to Hafsos in sort of north central Iceland to see the Emigration Museum. It's good for the people of Icelandic descent who are in Canada and the United States so they can get some assistance in tracking their genealogy, but I think it's also good for the Icelanders to, to think a bit about those who left. Hostels have been for a long time a trade center and the fishing village, their fishing business have been going down in Iceland, so a lot of a little town is dying. It is probably close to 20,000 people who left Iceland. And in that time it was 88,000 people in Iceland. So you can see that's a lot. I have a lot of family members in Canada. So I start to read something about that. And when I start to work here with these houses, this idea came up to to do something to memorize these people who left Iceland for, for Canada and the US. We call these people today Vester Islandingar, as in Western Icelandic people. We can say it's a whole history behind why people left and what happened in their life. 
how was to go over the ocean to find a new land, a new home, and how they fit into the new land and the feeling behind. So. We are on Drenge Island on the north coast of Iceland. And this particular island was the last days of a famous saga hero named Grettir. Grettir was an outlaw and he was able to fight and conquer trolls and all sorts of sorcery and it all kind of came down to this big event that took place on this Drenge Island. He lived up there in the top. He was ultimately killed up there. Well, the sagas were said by many, even non-Icelanders, to be the great literature of the Middle Ages. Being that close, again, it's just nice to stand on the place where this saga unfolded. And it was a spectacular day, and what a great place to make photographs. One of the beauties of photography is that uh, you end up in places like this. And so it's, um, it gets you out the door. And, and I mean, I never would have come here were it not for this, having read the saga and had this opportunity to photograph in another part of Iceland. Icelanders were half heathen and half Christian in the year 1000. So uh, there was a political pressure from Norway that we would all be Christians. And there was a wise man and uh, he, he was asked to make a decision on behalf of all of Icelanders. So he laid down and slept on it for a night. And then the morning after he decided that we would be Christians probably for a very practical reason, to avoid war with the Norwegians. He went home to his farm and took all the hidden totem poles or pictures of the old gods and threw them into a waterfall close by called Goda Foss. And Goda Foss really means the waterfall of the gods.
This is sort of the epicenter of Askia, the volcano that erupted in 1875 that really sped up the emigration process of the Icelanders to the New World, to Canada, the United States. Because the ash, there was a wind from the southwest, it blew the ash to the northeast, the ash killed the grass, the sheep didn't have grass to eat, so it really put the pinch on the people who were living sort of a marginally subsistent living. And that pushed the emigration into full gear. One of those people was my great-grandfather, um, Sigebjorn Goodmanson. So he lived up in the Northeast, and he ended up in Mountain, North Dakota. It's a spectacular place with this massive lake here and this one mile across crater surrounded by these mountains. So it's quite a, quite a spectacular landscape. There is a pot which was originally an explosive crater. One bank sort of made the crater, but on the bottom of that crater, there is a, a warm lake you can swim in. But uh, the name of that crater is Viti, which is Icelandic for hell. So you stand at the edge of hell and you sort of smell the brimstone. But people go and bathe in hell. We're up in the northeast corner of Iceland. In 1881, my great-grandfather was living over there where you see that white building. And this cemetery and this church behind us were, uh, were frequented by his family and those before him. And it was from there in 1881 that he and his wife and their infant daughter walked some 95 miles over to Vapnafjörður and got on a small freight boat and was taking Icelandic ponies and Icelandic immigrants to Scotland. Got on a train to Glasgow, a boat to Canada, down the Great Lakes to Duluth, a train across, caught a boat down the Red and went through then Fort Garry up to Gimli. And so they spent a couple years in Gimli, and then when the community of Mountain opened up, they walked down to Mountain and uh, staked the homestead in 1883. So this is what he looked at. This is what his family looked at, his parents, and um, roughly back about 1,000 years to the point when uh, they came over from the Faroe Islands and before that from Norway. So this was his view. This is the ancestral landscape. And so it's just this marginal grazing land from the crest of this hill to the edge of the lava, uh, and this wasn't much. So in 1875, when Askia blows, this marginal grazing land gets covered with ash and the grass is killed and eventually the sheep population goes down. He was farming with his brother-in-law so they were landowners. I mean they could have survived I expect but the decision to go was made by many. But this, this isn't unlike North Dakota. I mean outside of the big mountains <laughs> but this kind of openness, I mean this sort of open view is uh, um, I mean, he would have felt quite at home in the, in the valley or on the edge of the valley. What kind of names were you looking for? Well, good news is a, is a, is a comp, you know, names were used. When this trip came up, our daughter, Leave immediately asked, oh, can I go along with you? And I, of course, that'd be just great because I'm the dad and 
happened to like her quite a bit. So that was great to kind of, again, share some places she hadn't seen with her. Chances are our relatives would probably not have markers. She's been here before, and she then was very excited about puffins and, and horses. But this time she came, you know, as a, as a 21 year old and I think in some ways started to ask questions that suggested an awareness of her ancestry. See, if they left in 1880, there's, it's very unlikely that there'd be any markers left. But I think what is, what is significant is this was the place and that was the view. It really does resemble North Dakota. I was thinking the same thing. Yeah. If you take away the mountains. Yeah, and, and exactly, because it has that same kind of openness. Well, all so in they all, left. it's a lovely place. All in all, it's a <laughs> lovely place. No, this is it. This is, this is good being here. I, I mean, that's so breathtaking. It almost seems futile to try to take a picture of it. I think when the Icelanders came here, Iceland had all kinds of birds, but only foxes and mice. So they brought along sheep, cattle, horses, and chickens, and pigs, and also some goats. This is what they brought. We have this bird, the Arctic tern, Kria, which is one of the most popular birds, that comes all the way to Iceland from the South Pole, every spring and then goes back in the fall. They fly 40,000 kilometers a year. That's around the Earth, the same distance. And we have uh, either ducks, and of course we have eagles and hawks, but they're really rare though. Puffins, yes. Very beloved amongst tourists and very beloved amongst Icelanders to eat. Once they're born, they need to spend their first winter at sea. Recently, with urban development, the puffins get distracted by the lights on their way to the sea, and these baby puffins often end up in the town, stranded, and they, they can't get out, and they'll, they die in the towns. I went out in the middle of the night and joined this, um, this village's tradition, which is the children go out at night and they chase puffins. So you run really, really fast after these awkward little penguin-like <laughs> birds and you try and snatch them up and you collect them in cardboard boxes and you gather them and you hold them like a football and you <laughs> chuck them as hard as you can out into the sea. And that's supposed to kind of get them pointed in the right direction and back into the sea. Bye. 
Not bad. We are at the southeast corner of Iceland, and it's a spectacular day. This ring road, this road, highway number one, has really only gone around the island for maybe 30 years. So this road, relatively speaking, is pretty new. And it's, this corner is spectacular because there's multiple fjords and it goes in and out. And the road just kind of skirts this wonderful kind of grassy shoreline and this very dramatic series of cliffs. It's pretty spectacular. What I'm trying to do is to get something of the shoreline. My frame kind of goes around the top of the clouds, cuts back over, takes in these rocks, and goes out and just includes that tip of land there. So it's a very nice little composition. A friend lent me a 4x5 Speed Graphic. Now, a Speed Graphic is a camera that was popular in the 40s and the 50s. It was a newspaperman's camera and had a large negative. It was rugged, you could pound nails with it. Nothing fancy about it. I learned that the bigger negatives would give you a sharper image. And so that kind of directed my interest in these cameras. I think black and white is more evocative. There's a separation from our perception of the world in color. And it becomes something kind of a little bit removed, and I guess I like the idea that this two-dimensional piece of paper is a separate reality from that place. Sometimes you make a picture to somehow just pay homage to the raw beauty of a place. You just sort of can't not, and, and there it is, and so I wonder, I wonder what I can do with this. But I think more times than not, the pictures that I end up being attached to or feeling good about are, are the ones where I found something sort of small and perhaps insignificant that I can make some sense out of. So it has to do with, you know, with this 4x5 rectangle and, and what do you put in there that can visually resonate, not to the point of being overly formalistic or compositional. I mean, you always want to sort of hide your fingerprint, you the artist, but it is a celebration of the common. This ice I have in my hand, it is between 1,000 and 1,500 years old. In 1932, about 75 years ago, this lagoon did not exist. The glacier touched the ocean out there. Now we have about five kilometers from the bridge and to the face of the glacier. And uh, the glacier is losing about 100 meters every year. This be uh, the densest uh, ice in the world, right here. It is. This is like small depth of field, so there's not going to be much in focus. But Since my first trip to Iceland in 92, 93, you know, I've made many trips and I always keep a diary and I mentioned I, I've started to photograph my ancestral landscapes and the next project is going to be called A Song for Leave and it's a story, it's a collection of my rewritten diary excerpts with a photograph of mine set in these different places. The name A Song for Leave is taken from a book called Song Lines and it's about the Aboriginal people in Australia who keep track of their nomadic travels by creating songs that record the, the, you know, the, the physical features of the landscape. So maybe it's a walk two days before this river or before that mountain. So they sing a song that, that, that is the map. They felt that if the song was not sung, the land would die. So what that means is that it's incumbent upon us to sing our song. So that's what it is, it's my gift to her. Uh, you look through the dark cloth, 
and tell me where I'm at the edge. Is it here? Can you see my foot? Now? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Can you see my foot now? How about how about now? Funding for this program is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund, the North Dakota Council on the Arts, and by the members of Prairie Public.